Hi everyone, in this video what we're going to learn is how to make database synchronization with XPO. So let's start with the agenda. First we will learn about the synchronization theory, then we will show some synchronization scenarios including master-slave and peer-to-peer. -peer. Then we will show an example of an implementation or how this theory works. Then we will learn which XPO providers we can use for synchronization, how to create the connection streams for these providers, some useful extension methods, the best practices for synchronization, and then some additional resources. Some stuff that is good to know when you're doing data synchronization with XPO, Xamarin, or SAF. So let's start with the synchronization theory. All the database synchronization, at least the one that we're doing here, is based on the idea of delta encoding, which is basically a theory that tells us how to store, what to store, and how to transmit the data. Uh, this data that we are going to save, we save it in some object called delta. So the delta store only the difference between two objects, two databases, or two files. So the delta include only a small piece of information to make two objects look the same. This is the question for the synchronization or the synchronization of deltas. Basically, the idea of this equation is telling you something like this. If you have version 1 and version 2, what you need to make version 1 versus equals to version 2 is the little pieces of information that are the difference between each of the versions. So basically the delta equation goes like this a delta that is also called a change is a sequence of em elementary changes or operation which when applied to one version in this case version one yields another version in this case version two so basically the idea is that you make two objects the same now let's start with the scenarios this is the most common scenario, which is the master-slave scenario. In this case, you have the master, which is represented here by a laptop, and then the master database, and then the server. So basically, in this case, you're entering all your information through the master, through this area here. And then you're pulling it or pushing it from the clients, in this case, Office A and Office B. All these clients here for Office A are saving deltas and data here. The same for Office B, they are saving data and deltas here. And after a while, you synchronize them with the master. So both will have a copy of the information. So here are the characteristics of this scenario. The initial data is created by the master, so by this here. All the clients can push or pull deltas from the master. So basically, in this case, the clients are Office A and Office B. The master is the source of truth. Why? Because at one moment, it will be the one who contains all the deltas. So all the information that you're processing here and you're processing here is like somehow partial. The only one who have something that like the source of truth or the most complete source of truth will be the master in this case. And each of the clients or the slaves will be equal to the source of truth or the master when you have processed all the deltas. So that's what we're saying here in the last point. The only way to make the Office A look exactly like the master is that Office A processed all the deltas or the difference in the data. The same goes for Office B. Now we're going to see a different scenario. This is not a master detail, but still you have a master database. So let's see how this goes. In this case, in a peer-to-peer -peer scenario, uh, basically what you're doing is that there is no master, there is no one creating the data for the master. 
is any of the peers who is creating the data. So the initial data can be created in client A, client B, or client C. All of the clients or peers can push and pull information from the master. In this case, no one should write directly to this database. All the information to the master should go only through push or pull operations. The master will be the source of truth because it will be the only one who at some moment will have all the complete information that these clients are creating or these peers are creating. And none of the peers is the source of truth. Why? Because client A at some moment will only contain the changes created by client A. And the same for the same goes for each client. Now here's an implementation example. So let's start with the master. And in here I will show some code from XPO so you can see how easy it is to implement uh, database synchronization. So it goes like this. Here I'm showing what a usual transaction looks on XPO. First I'm creating a, a unit of work using a data layer. Then with that unit of work I create some records, in this case some customers. And then I commit the changes. This commit will create delta 1. Then again I'm doing the same. A new unit of work some records and I'm committing the changes. Now I have delta 2. And one more time, the same data layer, unit of work, create records and commit changes. Now we have three deltas. So with these three deltas, we copy them to the clients, to any of the clients or the slaves, however you want to call them. And in the end, the result will be that the master and all the clients will have a table with this information. So by replicating the deltas, you're making the client databases look exactly like the master. Now, how do we do this? For this, we have created some XPO providers, the synchronization provider. So, we have two providers. In this case, we're going to start with the Sync Data Store, which is the original implementation. It works for web, desktop, Windows, and console environments, but it doesn't implement the asynchronous operations. And now we have the new version of the Sync Data Store asynchronous. We have troubles naming this provider because it starts with Sync and it ends up with asynchronous, but um, in general, in .NET, you, if something is a sync by nature, you add a sync in the end. But I didn't want to put sync and then a sync, so we named it asynchronous. So this is based on the original implementation, basically sharing the code with the original implementation. But it also implements the async operation. So you can use this type of provider for scenarios like .NET Core on which in some cases you really need, I mean it's forced by the framework to implement a synchronous operation. But besides that you can use it the same in WebAssembly, in Web, Web Forms, um, Desktop, Xamarin. So basically this will cover all the scenarios this will cover only some of the scenarios. The more traditional scenarios can be covered by the Sync Data Store, but all the new scenarios like Xamarin Forms, for example, and a REST API in ASP.NET Core, you should use this implementation instead. Now, let's continue. Here are the common characteristics between both providers. Both of them offer, in, offer delta tracking. So, uh, you can do the same basically with both of the providers. Or both of them will include the basic functionality of tracking the changes created on the data, created on the data, and then store them as deltas. Then delta processing. 
both of the providers can process deltas. So it means that each provider can get the deltas from another database and make them part of their own. Then both providers offering delta filtering. What is that? Is in some cases I don't want to include some entities on my delta tracking. For example, I want to exclude one table, the table customers, for example. So both of the providers are able to do this. Then the schema operations. You know that in XPO you need to create or update the schema. So both providers offer some expression functionality that will make this process like really, really simple, just one line of code. Then both of the providers can create an instance of a data layer. And in this case, we can create a simple data layer or a safe data layer. In both of the providers, you can implement your own synchronization logic. In most cases, this will change a lot between companies. For example, company A will have one method, let's say peer-to-peer, -peer, but company B will have master detail or master slave. So it's up to you on how to implement the synchronization logic. We do have some um, some proposal on how the synchronization should work. But again, since these providers have all the functionality to do delta tracking and delta processing, you can go to a lower level and create your own type of business logic. So as you know, XPO providers use a special connection string. So in here we will understand the parts of the connection string that we use for these two providers that I showed you before. So let's start with the XPO provider parameter. This can be sync data store or sync data store asynchronous. So in here below, we will see how the connection string is being created. So that's the first part of the connection string. Then let's continue. The second part that we need is a data connection string. This is basically any valid XPO connection string enclosed by single quotes. So see this example. In this example, we are storing the, del the data in an SQLite database called DataDB. The third parameter is the delta connection string. So these providers store the delta information in a separate database. And this can use basically any valid XPO connection string. So again, we put here the parameter and it's enclosed by single quotes. We're using SQLite again, and the name of the database is logdb. Now the fourth parameter is enable, enable delta tracking. This can be true or false. Sometimes you don't want to um, track the differences in the database, or you need to turn it off, like for some minutes or for some operations. So if you change this value in the connection string, you will be able to enable or disable delta tracking. In this case, we're setting delta tracking to true. And then the exclude entities. In some cases, maybe in big databases, or if you're using SAF, maybe you don't want to track all of the tables from, from your main system. Maybe you just want to track some of the tables. So with this, you can exclude entities. So this is basically a list of like a string separated by commas with the name of the entities that you want to exclude. So here we have an example. We are excluding entity 1, entity 2, and entity 10. And then the last parameter is the identity. So each connection to the database should have an identity. For example, the name of the device that you're using or the name of the database that you're using. In this case, the identity is client A. So this here is how 
a connection string for synchronization looks like. As you can see, it's like kind of like uh, strange because inside of your connection string, you have two other connection strings, one for the data and one for the deltas. So now let's see some utilities and network extensions. As I told you before, um, the provider, providers that we have here for synchronization, they don't include the business logic that you will use to synchronize the delta. But we have created a separate project called extensions, network extensions in this case, that enhance the functionality of the providers. So they are able to send and get the deltas from the server to do a push and a pull operations basically. So these extensions live on this assembly or NuGet, which is the same as the synchronization framework, but uh, the last part is extension. And then you have to replace the XXXX here for your assembly version. This will change accordingly to the Express version in general. So for example, right now is 20.5.24 or something like that, the current version that we have for the for this assembly. And when you include this, this reference in your project, you will have the ability to fetch deltas, which is basically download the deltas from the server, but not processing them. You will just get them to check them. I mean, and there will no changes. There will be no changes on your local database. Then you have the operation of pull deltas. In this case, you will download the deltas from the server, but you will process them. That, I mean, what that means is that when you process the deltas, you will include that information in your local database, basically. Then you also have the ability to push deltas, is to send all the difference that you have between the original database and your changes and send that to the server. Also in the utilities extension namespace, which lives in this assembly, you will have some other utilities. For example, filter deltas. Here you, with filter deltas, you have the ability to exclude some operation from each delta. Let's say that in a delta you will have 10 SQL sentences, but there is one that you don't want because you don't want to affect that table in your local database. So you can exclude it with the filter delta functionality. Also, you can get the base SQL queries. This will take all the information out of the delta and show you a pseudo SQL statement. Why is it called pseudo SQL statement? Because it's a generic SQL statement which at the moment, at this moment exactly, is not ready to be processed by your local database, but it will look like an ANSI SQL with all the, the information necessary to make your, data, your local database look, look like your master database or like your remote database. So the idea is that you can check the query that is going to be executed before it's executed and you can decide if you want to filter it out or not. Then there is some functionality, this is especially related to XPO, to update the schema. So in some cases, there are some ways to update the schema or create the database. And in other cases, for example, in the peer-to-peer -peer scenario, you have to proceed in a different way. We will understand more about this when we see the, the scenario in code we will check the unit test to see how this should work. And also get a data layer, which basically creates a, an XPO data layer. This can be a simple data layer or a thread safe data layer. So uh, we have a special method for that, which make it like really simple. Now, let's understand what the best practices are for replication. First, you need to define your master entities. What does this mean? Is like, let's say that you have an ERP system and basically your master entities will be 
tables like product and customer. And the tables which hold the transaction are the ones who should be modified in the clients or the slaves. So in the ERP case, it will be like invoice and invoice detail, but not product or customer then you need to be careful where you're modifying your data. What does this mean? You do have a synchronization framework in hand with this product, but synchronization is more than the product. It's uh, like a methodology or a logic or a framework, let's say. So you should create some set of internal rules yourself that it doesn't allow the clients or the slave to modify part of the master data. This is not necessary. You can do it as you want. But if you follow these practices, it's less likely that, that you will uh, end up having um, collisions or conflicts in your data. The same, this uh, point is also related use the clients or the slave to create transactional data. Okay, so we learned before that it's not good to touch the master tables or entities in the clients. Why? Because th this can create scenarios that are really difficult to track. But in the opposite side, you can create transactional data, which is the data that is using all the masters, but is creating records only on your local database. The other best practice is to synchronize your client. Try to synchronize your client as often as you update or change the information in your master database. So let's say, for example, that you create new customers during the morning, before noon, before lunch. So at lunch, it will be good that all the clients pull the information from the master. So you need to create your own synchronization schedule because the framework doesn't provide a method for that. You decide when to pull or push um, the changes from the server. Um, the other point is to make a synchronization schedule. For example, let's say that every day you want to synchronize all your clients or slaves at early in the morning and in the end of the afternoon. So you know that all the clients will be on the same state like during the morning and that you can process the all the information created by the clients by the end of the day in the master. Um, because there are some cases when people want to do it randomly like 10 times per day or whatever you want in the in both in the master or the client so that can create a scenario that are really difficult to track so it's better to have a synchronization schedule for all the clients and the master like um, the clients should pull the deltas from the master in the morning and push all the changes by the end of the day and you should avoid modifying transactional data in the clients or on the slaves. What does this mean? If you have client A and client B both creating invoices, client B should not modify a record created by client A because both will have permission to modify that and that can create a conflict. So in the case that you're using something like SAF, that you have a security system, you should set the rules or the permissions that each client should modify only the data that belongs to it. In this case, uh, each client should be able to modify their own invoices, but not, but not someone else's invoices. So here we have the recommendations for a master-slave scenario. First, you need to register your XPO synchronization provider, any of the two versions that we have, and I showed you before. 
then you need to update your schema with delta tracking enabled and create object type records set to true. These are the default settings. Then set up your connection string with delta tracking enabled. Now in your staves, you need to register any of the XPO synchronization providers, set up your connection string with delta tracking enabled, update your schema with delta tracking disabled and create object type record set to false. Then pull the first deltas and this will include for your slaves uh, any of the initial data created by the master and the object type records. That is something that the XPO infrastructure needs internally. And then you can push and pull the deltas as needed. Now for a peer-to-peer -peer scenario it's like even easier in this case. So for any of the peers you need to register the XPO synchronization providers, update your schema with delta tracking disabled and create object type records set to true and then push and pull deltas as needed. And finally here we have some additional resources that is good to know and read about them. So basically if you are going to use ASP.NET Core it's good that you understand the fundamentals which is how the services work on ASP.NET Core and then for XPO it's good to know how and when XPO extend the schema in the database, what are the object type records, the best practices for XPO and how XPO use conflict resolution. So basically our XPO providers for synchronization they don't provide any conflict resolution we use the same that XPO offers. And then if you're going to use SAF you need to know how to set up the security system that is good and it will help you create like strong scenarios where you will almost never or never have any conflict and then how to use the security system in non-SAF applications and well that's it for this video so i see you guys on the next video where we will double check and understand some of the scenarios we will use part of the unit test framework and the unit test created for these two XPO providers. So see you guys on the next video.